Gee, it's never gone that quiet that quick before. Is, have we got the air conditioner up too high or something? Well, praise God. You're all having a great holiday and well, who, who's back in full bore now? Going like crazy. Okay, a few of you. All right, well, praise God. You know, this Christmas period, I know, is a time where we can, uh, can sort of kick back and have a rest. And um, I think, you know, we just need times in our life where we do throttle back a bit. Uh, because if you don't, you just wear out on the inside. Okay, your physical body can show signs, and it's a little bit more obvious as we get older. But what happens in our spirit is that we just be- start becoming hardened and, and, hardened and calloused. Um, we, it's almost like we get burnt out. Amen? And so, um, all through the Jewish calendar, God put in different holidays. Uh, and the people were uh, obliged to take the holidays. I um, mean, you could get, uh, I forget what all the penalties were, but, the, you know, they, they were quite severe for not taking the holiday. And so, there was three main ones in the year, and, and one of those holidays, Feast of Tabernacles, lasted the whole week. And people were just called to just come before the Lord at that time. And of course, guess what? The people didn't, uh, or a lot of the people didn't, and their spiritual life just all tended to drive up, uh, dry up. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with what we want to talk about today. But uh, let me just encourage you, if you've still got a bit of time left, if it's not too intense, take some time seeking God. Amen. Well, I thank everybody who came out for the prayer meetings uh, during the week. Uh, you know, prayer meetings, there, there are lots of different sorts of prayer, and we're actually going to be focusing on prayer this term. And um, the prayer meetings that, uh, that we had this week were intercessory prayer meetings. Uh, you know, that um, God does nothing uh, unless we pray. Well, that's almost true. That's 99% true, okay? But we need to pray. We need to, you do not have because you do not ask. And so, uh, we we ask, and we ask for the routine and the mundane things, but they're often the routine and mundane things are the most important things in our lives. Amen? And so, we stood in the gap for our nation, uh, our church, our city, our councils, and that takes a bit of time. Sometimes Christian prayers are just tip and run stuff. Who's ever played tip and run? Is it really real cricket? Not really, is it? You know? <laughs> and, and sometimes tip and run prayers can be a bit like that, uh, where we don't really get in and, and, and engage with God, and, or sometimes we need some understanding. So we pray with our understanding, pray with the Spirit, and thank you for all of those guys who turned out uh, this week and did that. Um, there are other types of prayer meetings where you just sit in the presence of God and allow the Holy Spirit to move and that sort of thing. Uh, we ought to be having those too. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with the word either. But you've had it. I should sit down now, shouldn't I? Um, What I'd like to talk about today is God's purpose for the earth. Why did God bother making the whole thing in the first place and putting people on it? Uh, Why did he create a universe? Who's been reading and watching the television recently at looking at new discoveries, some planet the other side of Neptune, and, uh, you know, all sorts of things being discovered when men look into... uh, People look up into the heavens all the time. It's fascinating. But why did God make us on this infinitesimal small speck of rock uh, in this infinitely large universe? Well, there's something special about this place. Well, no, it's not about this place. It's about God. And my... uh, Can we put the first scripture up? Okay. Okay. You can see that from the back well, can't you? Okay. All right. Well, if you get your Bibles out, Genesis 1, verse 26, verse 28. This is going to give us a bit of a clue. But let's pray before we get into this. Father, we just thank you that... uh, Well, we thank you, Father, that uh, you have recreated us in spirit to be able to receive revelation, to be able to receive insight and understanding about this world, this creation about the kingdom of God. And Father, you've given us your word, Father, to enlighten us. Uh, Father, your words are not just human words taught by human wisdom, but they are 
They come from yourself. They are the things that you've spoken, the things that you have given us, Father, to, uh, to, to give us understanding, to change our very lives. Father, you've given us a peek into heaven, a peek into your eternal purposes. And so as we look this morning, Lord God, open it up so we get more understanding, more wisdom, and that your word might even change everything that we think about and do in life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I thought I'd play with the, uh, a new feature on the latest version of PowerPoint here. I may only ever do it once, especially if a few of you tap me on the shoulder later on. Okay, we're in Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. So God created all this, this wonderful uh, world, filled it with all sorts of uh, wonderful things, put man on it and said, rule over it. And then moving over to Numbers uh, 14 verse 21, uh, where God's sort of rehearsing, or should I say Moses is rehearsing uh, God's purpose for this earth. And he says, but indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Here in Genesis 1, God is telling Adam to fill the earth. Now, obviously, he's speaking about, look, you know, hey, here's a wife. Go for it, guys. Fill the earth with people. But God's intention was that Adam would always uh, manifest the presence of God wherever he went. Now, God could have filled the earth with just blinding light. He could have sent angels shooting around like, you know, um, uh, well, he could have sent angels everywhere blazing. Uh, he makes, what does it say, his ministers fire. Uh, God could have put his glory on the earth that way. But how did he decide to do it? Man. And fill man with his spirit. And send man into the earth. And man, full of the spirit of God, brings the glory of God. Amen? I just wonder if we could sometimes have a look down on this earth with, you know, heavenly eyes. And do you know there's a glow on every one of you guys? There's a certain light in you. Amen? Some glow brighter uh, than others. Some a little bit more filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? That's okay. The neat thing is that you can get filled even more. You can have the glory of God on you in a greater measure because he gives it without measure. But there's a little bit of a process, amen, that we go through. Okay, so um, it was always God's intention the whole earth be filled with the glory of God. Now, how many of you remember, and I, don't, I just don't have time to, to look at it uh, too, uh, in, in too much detail, but you remember there were some rivers that ran out of the Garden of Eden. Amen? Man was put in the middle in the Garden of Eden and can anybody remember how many rivers flowed out? Four, the theologians say. Can anybody remember what they were? Euphrates, Tigris, Gihon, and I, you've got the Euphrates. I've forgotten the other one. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so four rivers. They're flowing out of the garden. Amen. And, I mean, what are rivers good for? Transport. Amen? So it was God's intention originally for the, 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 the river, the stream flowing from the center would take the glory of God out of the garden. We see later uh, in Revelation into some of the temples from where God's throne is in the temple, there is a river that flows out in the book of Ezekiel. And so from God's presence, there are rivers that we can get into. Amen? And those rivers will take us into the world. That will take us into places where we can bring God's glory. We'll have a little bit more of a look at what, exactly what, how we manifest the glory of God probably next week. Okay, so God created the earth 
for obedient man to live in. And uh, Adam was to go forth, populate the earth, to, to uh, declare God's purposes and be his messenger. Uh, you know, sometimes I ever... Has anybody ever speculated what it might have been like if man hadn't have disobeyed God in the first place and sin hadn't come into the world? It could have been... A, well, I, don't, I just sometimes think we, we can't fully imagine what it's like. I mean, some of us enjoy going up into the mountains or lakes or, or, uh, and looking at the beauty of nature. Uh, but what we've got today is nothing compared to what it would have been back then. Um, I think the whole topography, topography of the earth uh, would have been different. Because uh, throughout the first few chapters of Genesis, there are descriptions of what the earth was uh, like uh, before the flood of uh, Noah. Um, it um, indicates that, the, that there was some sort of water vapor or more intensive cloud covering around the earth at the time. Um, this would have had a sort of a, a warming effect on the earth. And so you would have had a more even temperature right around the earth. How many of you think our summers get a bit hot? Yeah? Um, I'd probably get more hands up if I get somebody to turn the aircon off now and ask the question in half an hour's time. Um, how many of you think the winters get a bit cold? If you want to turn on the, on the television and see what they're experiencing in, in Washington and the east coast of uh, America right now. But there was a sort of more uh, even temperature right around the whole earth. That's why, you know, now you can find these fossils of... Uh, subtropical plants in places like Antarctica and uh, uh, you know so it, it would have been a much more comfortable place to live back in those days um, well Genesis uh, also describes the events that happened during Noah's flood uh, where it says the fountains of the deep were opened the floodgates of the sky and so with, uh, were, were, um, were opened as well um, I mean, catastrophic events occurred at that particular time. I, and uh, I don't know, it, it's, I mean, you can go into the, some of the answers in Genesis uh, or the answers in Genesis website and read some of the articles there of what happened at the time. But the Earth's crust, I mean, was just being incredibly stressed. There were volcanoes, there were earthquakes, there was water, massive water spouts bursting out. I mean, this would have been superheated water that would have just been like geysers that, that would have, you know, gone thousands of feet up, turned into, you know, water droplets spread across and then fall as a torrential rain on the earth. That time uh, of God, of what we call God's judgment, happening uh, with, at, at the time of the flood uh, just changed the earth so much. Water covered everything. Amen? And then there came a settling. Um, it's interesting, actually. Uh, the earth's crust at that particular time was going through all sorts of changes. Uh, the Bible says the mountains were pressed up and the, the, the seas, uh, you know, were, were, um, were formed, the sea beds were formed. It's rather interesting, actually, that some of the youngest rock, um, well, when they, back in, I think, about the 60s, when they were f finally able to get down to the, the, um, the bottom of the, um, the ocean trenches, they found rock down the bottom of it, which, which was extremely young, way younger than they actually thought. And uh, so... The events that happened uh, at that particular time, there were great fissures open d through uh, the, what we ha now, where our oceans now exist, right down through the Pacific Ocean, around the other side of the planet, and, de planet and down through the Atlantic Ocean. These big ocean oceanic trenches that sunk down. And uh, these things were filled up. And so you can imagine, who's ever seen a, a, a decent flood? Anybody been in a decent flood? I mean, just a small flood can do a lot of damage and can change things quite a bit. 
but I mean the, the effect of large volumes of water draining off, often at speed, uh, there's nothing more powerful than water when it's moving quick. You can cut through steel with water if you can get it moving quick enough. Uh, and so, I mean, what we've got today is nothing like what would have uh, occurred, been back there in Adam's day. Well, uh, why do I say all that? Um, as there were massive uh, geological changes, so there were massive spiritual changes that occurred. Um, tragic effects that were less visible to the eye, but all the, all the same, they were there. Adam's treason had given opportunity for Satan and a whole hierarchy, a whole hierarchy of spiritual beings to now take possession of the earth. And these things flooded in like crazy and took possession of the earth because Adam had delivered it over to Satan in the garden. He'd given him dominion. And of course, if you've just been given dominion somewhere or of something, you go in and take possession of it. Amen? If you've just bought a new house, do you wait a couple of weeks before you go and take possession of it? No, you, you move in quick. Uh, and the devil moved in. And um, from that state, uh, it just, just things went downhill. They wrecked havoc, not only on the earth, but also in the hearts of men in subsequent generations. And so wars and murders and all sorts of mayhem, sin, sickness, disease, death, entered in. And uh, the changes to mankind were phenomenal. Amen? The glory of God, which is probably the most beautiful thing ever, uh, lifted off man. And man became a real shadow of what he was originally. The glory of God had, had lifted off man, almost had lifted off the earth. And over subsequent generations, well, it took a very short time, within a thousand years, uh, was God had looked at the whole earth and he said, look, you know, th this has gone crazy. I can't let it continue. Amen? And so the, the judgment we just talked about uh, occurred. God had to bring in judgment. And there is a place where when sin gets so bad, God sends in judgment. And I know this probably doesn't sit well with people that think that God only does good. But, you know, sometimes punishment and judgment is good too. Amen? And the earth has experienced the judgments of God over the centuries. And, you know, if you ask people and Christians in Syria and places like that right now, uh, you know, they're going to have to tell you that, look, there, there are judgments that are coming on the earth. The right to live in a country. I mean, who does the earth belong to in its fullness? It belongs to God. And God appoints times and seasons for different people at different times. Nothing is forever. And when a nation or a people... Uh, disobey God and, and turn away from his ways, uh, not only does God turn from them, but it, 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 it opens the door for all manner of evil and unrighteousness. And when this, a, a nation that gets flooded with this, I think sin and, and evil by its very nature call out for judgment. They are uh, self-destructive things. But um, there comes a time where God has to pull back the Spirit of God lifts. The glory lifts off a nation. And judgment happens to that. And there have been many nations and ethnic groups and that have perished from the face of the earth over the centuries because of evil uh, practices they did. You've heard of the Aztecs and the Incas and the, uh, the, the people up in Cambodia, uh, you know, the Angkor Wat, and, and, and a number of other different places around the world. Civilizations that went for a while, that have disappeared off the earth. Amen? God has a purpose. He, it was established in the very beginning in the garden. He wants to fill the earth with his glory. 
And the stuff that doesn't bring him glory, the stuff that is the opposite, God will clear off and out of the way. Amen? Okay. Um, God's eternal purpose uh, has not changed. It never will. And that's to see the whole earth, uh, earth filled with his glory. That means that ultimately the whole earth will be brought under the dominion of God. Uh, and, and, and what does that mean? Well, it means where every, every decision uh, is made by his authority according to his will. What are we asked to, to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which lives in heaven, dwells in heaven. Um, I'm trying to remember it here. Uh, yeah, okay. Got lots of help on this one. Uh, but he says, thy, your kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's purpose. When that stuff happens, that's when God's glory falls. And that's God's ultimate intention. And are we working with that process or are we working against it? Amen? Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. Amen? Well, God eventually did. Uh, he always had a plan to redeem his fallen planet. And, of course, that was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus and uh, his redeeming of mankind for himself, providing an answer for sin and destruction. Uh, okay, so... Um, Here's a scripture in Isaiah 52, verse 5 to 7. There we go. go. Now, therefore, what do we have here, declares the Lord? Seeing that my people have been taken away without cause, again the Lord declares. Now, remember, the, the people had been taken away because of their sin and rebellion against God. Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Therefore, my people shall know my name, Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. And then he goes on and says, How lovely on the mountain are the feet of them that bring good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to, God, uh, to Zion, Your God reigns. Okay, so God's people come under judgment from time to time. We as individuals sometimes can walk off that highway of holiness and walk over onto the devil's ground. And you know, if you walk onto the devil's ground, what happens? You start getting hammered. How do you get off the devil's ground? Well, you walk back to that narrow path, that, that highway of holiness, which the Bible says about no deadly beasts going up on that. It is a, a, a clear path. Amen? There is a path that we are called to follow where the presence of the Lord is. But... You know, you're probably just like me. There are times we take our little diversions. Hopefully we don't stray too far from the path because, uh, you know, some people stray from the path and never find the thing again. But there is a path that we're called to walk. And the Lord is there to guide us and, he, 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 you know, he, he helps us along that particular path. But here was a nation, 700 BC, uh, had wandered from that path. And they had been delivered into captivity. And, of course, the, they were being treated quite badly in that. But God said, hey, here's some good news for you. And he talks about the feet of them who bring that good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness. Those are the people that call people back to the path, to obedience to the Lord, to God's plan of salvation. That's what we're called to be. This is the thing that brings God's glory. In John 17, it talks about how we bring God, glo God glory by bearing fruit. And people are the fruit that God is looking for. Amen? I mean, that uh, movie we saw on uh, Wednesday night was a, a marvelous example of this, The War Room. How many of you have not seen The War Room? Okay, you need to, you need to see if you can see that. It's a simple thing. I mean, some Christian movies sometimes leave me a little bit cold, uh, you know, a little bit awkwardly embarrassed about them sometimes. But this one was very good. Uh, it was about a little old lady who had been through a bit of hell in her life 
and uh, she is a Christian, has a regular prayer life. She comes across this woman whose family is breaking up. The husband and wife are all sorts of in all sorts of strife, and uh, she decides to start praying for this family. And uh, first of all, God comes to the woman and gets her to repent of her attitude. Always goes the most spiritual one first, usually. And, uh, uh, you know, she repents of, the, of what she contributed to her family uh, strife and trouble and starts praying for her husband. And, of course, you know, uh, long story made short here, uh, God moves in and brings restoration. It's a marvelous story. Um, but then this woman, this older woman, as soon as that happens, she, she, she looks for another project. She asks God, not for a million things to do, but just one thing to do. And she takes hold of that one thing, a person, and doesn't let him go and praise for them. And sure enough, God moves through her prayer. God is no respecter of persons, and God will, uh, will move through the prayer of whoever is willing to pray. But what happens often is we start praying, again, these tip-and-run prayers sometimes, and we give up. You know, we give up before the baby's born. And uh, things are never brought to full term sometimes in our prayer. Well, anyway, this, this was a great example of just what can happen if you just take hold of some person in difficulty and pray for them. And don't just go for your own, your own family. I mean, if your own family's in difficulty, well, you probably need to get some people praying for you. Um, but look out. There are people out there God wants to bring into your orbit, so to speak, into, you know wants to bring into your life so you can pray for them and, and counsel them a little bit as necessary. And God wants to move in their life, but he needs to move through you. Amen? And then, of course, the neat thing about this one that really impressed me is when this woman had, and her husband had reconciled and back in church and the family was really doing well, she challenged this woman she'd been prayed for, uh, uh, praying for to go and do it to somebody else. Look for somebody else that you can, you know, help and pray for and, and, and be that person reaching out to. And I thought, you know, gee, that's, that's simple. That's very simple, but very profound. And that's how the glory of the Lord is spread. Amen? Person to person, quite simply, really. Okay, um, I want to introduce you to a couple of Greek words. Some of you know these. Can I throw them up? One is obedience and one is disobedience. Okay, the Greek word obedience, um, remember our New Testament is written in Greek, uh, is this word hupakuo, which comes from hupo meaning under and akuo meaning hearing or meaning to hear. Okay, so hupakuo means to hear under. Which, okay, I mean, hupakuo, to hear under, is the word for obedience. So, if we want to be obedient to something, what do we do? We hear. To hear is to obey. Uh, I think that's a, probably more of an Arabic uh, statement. Uh, and, but it's to hear underneath. It's to submit. It's to place oneself under another authority or greater authority in order to hear. So that's what obedience is. It means uh, submitting yourself. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about submitting to the Word of God. Amen? Submitting to God. So it's not, uh, it's putting ourselves under. It's humbling ourselves in order to hear. That's what obedience means. Okay, so obedience without humility, without actually putting yourself under the authority, is not really obedience. Let's look at what disobedience is here. The word translated disobedience in the New Testament is the word para akuo, which again, two words, para meaning beside, paramilitary, paramedical, you know the, the thing, something that runs alongside of something. 
But actually it has uh, a slightly greater meaning in the biblical sense here, where it says that it's also uh, para meaning beside or alongside with the intention of being against. Amen? Para, when you put yourself alongside something, uh, especially another authority, you're actually elevating yourself. And often it's with, as here, with the intention of being against. And this is the de devil's constant temptation to us, is, you know, as Aussies, as New Zealanders, we think, well, nobody's our, you know, nobody's lording it over me. We're as good as anybody. Don't amen now. Okay. <laughs> Would be inappropriate. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's and so what are, what are we moving in? We're moving in disobedience. And when we start doing that with God and spiritual authority, that, you know, that is moving according to the direction of the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? We're in disobedience. Amen. So in order to have the Spirit of, uh, move with the Holy Spirit, we've got to obey Him. Amen. And the Holy Spirit often comes to us in, in different ways at times. Uh, it can sometimes come through people. Now, that's not so, I'm not telling you that we have to obey every person that, uh, you know, um, that, that comes into our life, every authority, but we have to be very careful with this in this area because we can easily slip into disobedience. And look, what we practice out there in the thing, we'll, we'll bring it into church. You know, what you, you start practicing, what you're, you do on a daily basis, you'll do with God. And this is why constant, uh, you know, examining of ourselves through the Holy Spirit is required. Well, Lord, are we moving in disobedience? Because not all disobedience necessarily looks bad. But so I give you this concept here. So, you know, as we, as we look at life, as we look at the decisions we have to make, we can gauge, well, where's our heart here, God? I mean, there's a lot of things you shouldn't obey. Amen? A lot of things you shouldn't submit to in this world. We need to be discerning. Amen. We're talking about God's glory filling the earth. Okay, so back to the original intention here. Uh, God crowning his creation with mankind. And the next part of God's plan of redeeming mankind and accomplishing his eternal purpose on earth was to select more men whom he was going to put his glory on. More people that would, could carry his glory, be light bearers for him. And so we come into, uh, you know, a, a thousand years later or so, we meet this guy Abraham. Uh, and through his lineage, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, God uh, established a testimony to his glory in the earth. Up to the time of the coming of Abraham, there's almost nothing. Uh, the knowledge of God and the earth had, uh, even after the flood, uh, had disappeared within about a thousand years. Amen? And that seems to be the way of, of all flesh, where God's glory will come, and then we just get into disobedience. It starts in simple little things, but then eventually builds to a hard attitude. And God's glory lifts. Now in the New Testament sense, it doesn't mean that we lose our salvation in that unless we stop believing in Jesus, but uh, God can sometimes not move through us because of disobedience. Now disobedience doesn't mean you're out there doing bad stuff all the time. It's often a hard attitude. The Holy Spirit is very sensitive. Amen? And God, I mean, you know, he, he sees the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. We're not always aware of them. And so, you know, yes, he loves us. And yes, he works and he, he knocks on the door of our heart and asks if we can come in. But sometimes we leave it shut, don't we? Okay, so God then found a, a family and then a nation to bring his glory into the earth. Uh, however, Satan exerted his power over this nation and brought it into bondage and slavery. Yet God would still see his purpose uh, established 
And he raised up a man called Moses, empowered him to lead Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt through the wilderness into a land of promise. So each of these three places is, is really symbolic of something greater that was yet to be revealed. Now remember, Egypt was a place of slavery where God's people had, had forgotten about him. And they thought that they'd come to the conclusion that God had forgotten about them. But eventually, they weren't crying out for, uh, to God for repentance about re uh, repentance. They were crying out just because of their misery. Uh, the horrible lives they were now leading as slaves in, uh, in Egypt. And they cried out to God. And eventually God heard them. And so his answer was to send a man filled with his glory. Amen. Remember Moses? He, 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 he uh, had a very shiny nose, face actually. When he spent time in the presence of God, he started glowing. What was that glow on him? Was it a real bad case of sunburn? Because he'd been up on this mountain, you know... <laughs> where everybody knows it's hot in Sinai Peninsula or wherever that mountain was. No, the presence of God on him, the glory of God on him, made him shine. In fact, he so freaked people out, he had to put a, a mask, you know, he had to put a, a veil over his, his head um, to, to, you know, just because people freaked out. And that's, that's what we need in us, the, the, the glory of God, amen? That was God's intention. So Moses led them out of Egypt. Egypt was a place of slavery. Uh, they were, well, successive generations. The sin of successive generations had resulted in a generation of people in cruel bondage. God eventually heard them. There must have been a few there that were actually good intercessors and prayed, I reckon, uh, probably could make a biblical case for it. But anyway, God decided to intervene, raised up one man, led them out of uh, Egypt with lots of signs and amazing mir excuse me, miracles. And then he led them, um, well, he led them out of Egypt through a wilderness and finally into this promised land. Okay, so in the place of slavery, God's people couldn't worship him. They weren't free to worship and serve him. They wanted to serve him. Pharaoh said no. You know, that's rather interesting. I wonder how many Christians are, are prevented or held back or somewhat restrained in their service for God by Pharaoh who says they can't. You know, and sometimes Pharaoh can rule. I mean, if Pharaoh is ruling in your life in certain areas, particularly in the employment area, you need to cry out to God for deliverance. It may not mean that you have to leave your job. In fact, let me just tell you, it probably, does, almost definitely doesn't mean that it's, you know, it, that's time to leave that job. But God can do things in your jobs, uh, you know, uh, to the hearts of Pharaohs. Amen? God is good at dealing with Pharaoh. So he led him into the uh, wilderness. A wilderness was a place of testing where God's purpose was to bring about a maturation in his people. He wanted to grow them up. Amen? And so he took him into the wilderness. Who's ever experienced some time in the wilderness? Who's in the wilderness at the moment? Well, it's a good place to be. It's a good place to be. I mean, Jesus had a great day once. He got to meet his cousin. They went for a swim together. Uh, well, but Jesus got baptized in the Jordan there. He was reconciled, or uh, not reconciled, but reunited with his cousin. And what did he do? Straight after that, he went off for a holiday in the, in the, in the desert. Okay, stretching the scripture a little bit to call it a holiday, but he went into the wilderness where God was working with him. But the one he encountered in the wilderness, who led him into the wilderness, the Bible says? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Who was the person he encountered in the wilderness the most? The devil it was there that uh, uh, Jesus was able to use the, the wisdom and the muscle that God had given him. Amen? To overcome the devil. So don't try to get out of the wilderness. It's a place where you obtain victory. And the victory you win in the wilderness then helps you in the promised land. Amen? I think there's probably a, uh, a lot of Christians around today who uh, 
sort of looking for their promised land or in their promised land, but because they never won certain victories in the wilderness, they can't enjoy the promised land. All right. Um, God's purpose in selecting a man, a nation, or a kingdom was not only to have a holy, sanctified people, but also to have an exportable commodity. Amen? God is looking... Well, God's purpose is export. He wants the, the, the news about who he is, uh, what his ways are, to be taken out. They're not just for you. Amen? I'll finish with this scripture. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 4, 4 to 6. I think that's... Have you got... There we go. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possess among, possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Okay, so um, at this particular point, Moses is being uh, uh, commissioned by God. Um, he says that there in, uh, was it verse 5, that uh, obey my voice and, and my covenant and you shall be my possession, my own possession among all the peoples. And he says, for the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Amen? Here's God's purposes. So somewhat... Uh, they seem a little bit strange to us today, but he's looking for a, a, his own possession, a people for his, of his own, or for his own possession amongst all the peoples. Now, who fulfills that function today? It's the church that God has called, the church of Jesus Christ. And why does he do this? Well, the earth is mine, he reminds it, the, uh, Moses here. And you shall be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, what on earth would you want a kingdom of priests for? Amen? What do priests do? Oh, the Old Testament, they were the ones who ministered the word of God. They were the ones who brought the knowledge of God to the people and uh, oversaw the, uh, the application of God's laws in the, in the society and culture and supervised it. Amen? So... The purpose of a nation or kingdom of priests was to minister to the other nations or kingdoms. God gave this nation of priests mighty testimonies of signs, wonders, and miracles so that they could testify before all nations the wonders that God had done for them. And so they could bring other nations to the obedience of God. I'll, I'll stop in this. I haven't completed what I wanted to give you today, but we've run a little bit short of time here is that, you know, God will give us testimonies. God's filled us with his glory. He wants that glorious light to be manifested. We can sometimes get in the way of it through disobedience. Amen? But uh, God wants to use you to impress other nations. Amen? Amen? And he will do all manner of signs and wonders and miracles in your life uh, in order to, to accomplish that purpose, especially if you are willing. Amen? Moses struggled with willingness at first, didn't he? We, we don't have time to go to all the accounts on the scriptures. But when God first met him at the bush, he says, no, not me, I can hardly speak. I get up behind the pulpit and then all of a sudden, blah, 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 blah. But God said, forget it, you'll do. I'm calling you. And uh, eventually uh, Moses uh, agreed and went to Pharaoh. And then it was miracle after miracle. But unfortunately, some of those miracles uh, meant a bit of tragedy in people's lives. I mean, all those plagues and that were good for Egypt. They were sent to wake him up. Unfortunately, their leader, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And when a, a leader of a nation or a church or any other thing, when their hearts become hardened, look out people. Amen? So, 
The glory of God is what it's all about. That's, that's his purpose. And sure, you getting saved and that are all important, but it's not the most important thing. Amen? Sometimes we think, uh, and you know, a modern gospel goes along the lines that you're so important to God and so precious and so loved that that's all there is. All that you need to do is know that. Well, that's true, but it's only partially true. There is a greater purpose. God has a greater priority, and that's to see his glory fill the earth. And I like to speculate that beyond that, it's to fill the universe. What's eternity all about? But that's pure speculation. You don't have to take notes on that, and you can disagree with me on that one if you like. But the glory of God manifest in the earth through you. Amen? Let's pray. Well, Lord, it seems like a difficult thing. Well, it is. But, Father, because you have purposed it, uh, then, Lord, for you nothing's impossible. And so, Father, I pr pray that every one of us just lifts our heart, our eyes, away from just our own lives, our own needs, own cares, own comforts, discomforts, etc., and look to your greater global purpose. That, Lord, as we align ourselves with you, and, Father, we look back through biblical history and we saw that when your people were obedient, blessing flowed. When they were disobedient, uh, Father, then they got into all sorts of strife. So I pray today, Lord, that uh, through your Holy Spirit, Father, not doubting your love for one instant, Father, I pray that, Father, we would hear what your Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And if you're touching us in any area, if you're nudging us about obedience, uh, it, to be obedient in certain things, then, Father, uh, help us. Lord, we just make that decision. We're going to obey. And the help comes after the decision. Lord, if we're moving in areas of disobedience, well, Lord, I pray that the fear of God would rule in our heart. Because, Father, we know it's the fear of God that leads us away from evil. Father, I pray for us and for the church uh, that, Father, a more sobering understanding, a more sobering grasp on ultimate spiritual reality, uh, Father, would, would um, take hold of us. Lord, help us, Father, to keep all things in perspective. Help us, Father, to keep walking that highway of holiness, walking on that path that walked clear of uh, that the devil and, and all his kingdom can't go up on. It doesn't understand it and actually hates it, so he won't go near it. So, Father, I pray that... Um, that that every one of us, Lord, would just be stirred today. Uh, Father, we just put aside all condemnation. Father, there's, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, we just put aside guilt and these sorts of things. But Father, we do acknowledge where we need to acknowledge uh, aspects of our lifestyle that may, we, we know in our heart of hearts that you want us to change. And Father, I pray for those that have difficulty changing and coming and making those quality decisions that stick. Uh, Father, that, um, that you will bring help to them in terms of other people and accountability. Uh, Father, that you will bring a way, Father, that they can walk off the devil's territory, away from Father, bondage. And Lord, it may involve a bit of wilderness. Uh, Job himself said, should I not accept, uh, only accept good from the Lord and not adversity? I thank you, Father, that, uh, Father, that you could give us grace in the wilderness. And that wilderness period is not to be forever. Father, we, we, we understand these things. So, Lord, we give you praise. We thank you that every one of us has, is called to walk this path. Jesus did it. 
and overcame in all things. And he gave us an example to be followed. So, Father, we thank you for that, that highway of holiness, that, that path of discipleship, whereby, Father, you bring us into your glory, that you pour out more of your glory on us, and that we become more effectual 